A quick word from today's sponsors. For all you content creators, small business owners and entrepreneurs, did you know that creating an income online or adding a new revenue stream to your business has never been easier? Have you ever considered taking your knowledge, skills and expertise and converting it into a course that you can sell online? Well, introducing Learn Worlds. Learn Worlds makes it easy to create, host and sell beautiful online courses that have an impact. With Learn Worlds' intuitive platform and a wealth of resources to educate yourself, you're only a few steps away from building a thriving online business in the booming knowledge economy. To find out more, visit www.trylearnworlds.com forward slash free. That's www.trylearnworlds.com forward slash free or follow the link in the episode description to start building your course today. Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Fault. Today we are continuing our coverage of Inglesha Necristo with a second interview from another ex-member. The support for the previous episode has been overwhelming and it's wonderful to see such a caring community all willing to help one another through the difficulties of leaving a group such as this one. But before we get started, I did want to give a quick shout out and a massive thanks to my newest patron, Renee. Although I haven't been releasing the exclusive content while I take some maternity leave, I really do look forward to getting back into the research side of things and recording some new material for all of my patrons, new and old. So thank you, Renee, for this amazing support. And thank you also to Catherine, who has signed up to sponsor the podcast through Red Circle, who host my show. I hope you both enjoy listening to the back catalogue of exclusive episodes available for those who subscribe. And in September, there will be more exclusive content on the way. Now let's get on to today's main topic, leaving INC. So hi, Sophia, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today and agreeing to share your story. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to our listeners? Yes, absolutely. I'm Sophia. Um, I'm on the podcast to talk about a movement called INC, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, I've been a me- I was a member of that sorry since birth until I was around the age of around twenty. Um, I discovered this podcast um, and agreed to an interview actually via a subreddit about this movement, um, which is four ex members that I discovered um, when googling very recently about oh why is it so hard to leave INC despite the fact that I've um, left. Um, nearly 20 years ago um and yeah Sophia is a fake name fantastic and INC is is shortened for something it is yeah so INC stands for Iglesia Ni Cristo um it's a branch of Christianity that was founded in the Philippines so it's um Filipino or Tagalog for literally means Church of Christ um it was founded in the Philippines in 1914 by a man called Felix Y Manalo um who was the first executive minister of the church um and so I, I, his family actually was um they were devout, he was descended from like devout catholics and i think he was actually like an apostate adventist don't quote me on that um because that's absolutely from memory um but what happened when like he he um I think he got kind of like obsessed with um, doctrine and stuff from like various other groups and was like constantly challenging it, etc. Until one day he went into a room, allegedly for three or four days, told everyone not to disturb him and then emerged, um, yeah, as I say, three or four days later with like the doctrines, which then became what INC or Iglesia was uh, founded on. Um, and so, yeah, some of the beliefs include, like, they, they be- INC believes and preaches that Felix Y. Manalo is the last messenger of God in quote unquote these latter days. Um, And yeah, unlike Catholicism, Anglicanism, and I think most other denominations of Christianity, um, this movement or church, it rejects the concept of the Holy Trinity. So, you know, God is God, it's not the Son or Holy Spirit, um, believes that salvation, i.e. the seat in heaven, is only achievable by a membership of the church. And this is drummed into you from the very, very beginning in various ways. Okay. And and you mentioned that this is a movement that was born in the Philippines and is practiced predominantly in the Philippines. Yes. But you clearly don't have a no. Filipino <laughs> accent. So no. um, how is it that you were born into this movement? Were you, were you living over with your family in the Philippines at the time or had the movement 
kind of immigrated to other parts of the world by that point yeah exactly so it's um, I don't know whether I go as far as say it's expansionist I probably would um they're always trying to like um grow and grow and grow and it came over to I mean you can hear like obviously I've got a British accent that's where I'm from um one of my parents is from the Philippines um and so that's how I was born into it it's actually been in the UK since the 70s I think I want to say the early 70s maybe the late 60s um but I think it's the early 70s um and so, yeah, like thinking because I was born in the 80s, so I was like, probably one of like the very early members of the uh, UK mm-hmm. uh, branches of it. Yeah. Especially second generation. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. Do you know how your parents, how did they meet through the religion or, or was it something that your that, that one of your parents was already involved in and converted the other parent? I, I, I'm, yeah. do, do you know that story at all? I do, yes. Yeah. So it was, yeah. The, the the my parent that was a member of the church um, um, is from the Philippines, um, and they met my other parent um, through work, I believe. Yeah, they, they met through work, and then they converted. Um, right. One one important thing I should mention about this movement is that um, salvation is only reserved for members. Um, so if you marry or date outside of the, the, of um, Iglesia, then um, you can be excommunicated unless you're successful in converting that person. So your parent, who was a, a devout member of, of INC, mm. converted the other parent and then... Yes. You you came along and and, and are there yeah. any other brothers and sisters? Is it a big family got, or a small family? No, our, our immediate family is a standard um, British sized family. So there's two kids. It's me and one other sibling. Um, my family in the Philippines is like far far bigger. I've got lots and lots of cousins, and mm-hmm. my parent from the Philippines has got lots of uh, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And your other sibling, um, I'm guessing they practiced INC as they grew up as well. Are they? A, they a, did. A, are they a, a currently a member, or have they distanced themselves as well? Yeah. So they distanced themselves around about the same time that I did, but um, then they went back. I think about. Well, it will be coming up to about ten years actually. I'm not. Inc- I'm not certain why. Every time I've tried to ask or have that conversation. Um, either barriers have gone up and or like, I don't want to talk about it or yeah it's a very very sensitive subject because yeah every, every it's, yeah it's one of those subjects I just I just cannot talk about with them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, anymore I have tried but it's all it's done is just resulted in huge huge arguments um, yeah it does that to families unfortunately but you you still have a relationship at some level it's not sort of like yeah. on the Jehovah's Witness level where you kind of would lose that 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 contact no. with that family member no so i they don't practice shunning in the same way as like scientology or jehovah's witness i think that's what they they, they refer to it as um so yeah I, I do still have a relationship um they i mean they've actually tr- in fact they've actually tried to get me back um a couple of times um in recent years um i'm not sure why because i've always said that i'm never going to go back um and it's a definitive no never um and I've given up trying to give my reasons as to why. Um, maybe I will again one day just to try and put it to bed. Um, but yeah, like they, they, they're still trying to grow. I happen to know actually that I think it's this year and I only know this from the Reddit that I'm on, um, but they're trying to grow. I think it is six brand new members or brand new recruits per locale. So like per um, church building, if you like. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. And I, I guess that I'm probably like a quote unquote easy target because I used to be there. So if I can be convinced, then, you know, they've got one back. Um, and, you know, I, I guess it's kind of done through love as well in a, in, a, in a weird way because they genuinely believe that salvation is through the church. And because they think that I this sounds so twisted, but they think that I'm going to hell because I left the church and, you know, I'm basically I'm an apostate um and so they they want to save me which sounds really I'm just I'm saying it out loud I've actually not spoken about this um out loud um at great length before so it's actually kind of um I'm trying to like unwrap it in my mind as yeah. I'm speaking, mm-hmm. even though I've made notes and prepared for this so it's yeah it's, it's kind of funny um no and like, and really you know well. and memories and things may come back to you as we talk and yeah. that's absolutely fine um yeah. you know always feel like you can you can 
kind of go here, there, where, yeah. wherever your kind of stream of consciousness takes mm. you if, if this is your first time speaking yeah. through it all. Because I find that particularly interesting. Um, yeah. So I guess if your family members that, that still practice, um, mm. they genuinely believe that obviously that movement is the one that will will save oh, whoever yeah. is involved. So they probably genuinely do worry about your spiritual well-being in oh, terms of, 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 you know, what's going to happen to you when the end days yeah. do come. Um, yeah. So it must be frustrating all around that, that you're kind of wanting them to see things from your perspective and they want you to see things from their perspective and it's just not going to happen by the sounds of it. No, it's not. I mean, I get messages. I, uh, I, I said that as plural. It used to be I got messages. Now I get kind of get one message in a while um, saying, you know, please consider, please keep an open mind. So my parent that is still there um, always says, you know, keep an open mind. And I said, you know, I've got the most open mind if um, like in comparison to members of that movement. Mm -hmm. um because mm -hmm. I'm the one that actually from even though I was born into it I, I knew from when I was about six years old that this wasn't for me um and I just yeah I just like I've been thinking critically about it I mean it's not for a six-year-old can a six-year-old think critically I don't know I, I've got a four-year-old I'm not sure he can think critically yet um but you know I, I've been trying to think and like look at other avenues and everything from when I was a very young age so I've had the, I've kept this open in mind and I, I really tried actually when I was probably in my teens like pre-teens and early teens I really tried to kind of like okay if this is it then I've I guess if that was a desperate I think that was a, a mix of like desperation of just like okay I'm never gonna get out so I might as well just go all in and everything um mm -hmm. but it just it just didn't work there was just so, too many things that just didn't make sense you know and I mean I guess that's not exclusive because I've actually landed on my atheist now after a long time um, so that part in terms of like, there's a lot of things that doesn't make sense. That's not exclusive to INC. There's a lot of things personally for, uh, for me um, about religion as a whole that doesn't make sense. And yeah. It's actually been interesting, like preparing for this um, interview, um, just to think about the differences between cult and religion. Um, mm -hmm. Because INC in the Philippines, I think is definitely seen as the cult. In the subreddit that we, um, con that where you contacted us, and there are a lot of members there that just say, yes, this is a cult, this is a cult. And I have actually landed very recently that, yes, this is a cult. But for a long time, I was like, well, you know, it's, it's actually, it's, a, it's an established religion. It is a quite a fundamental Christian beliefs, which it is. It loves the Old Testament, loves a bit of um, preaching about lake of fire and that you'll go swimming in the lake of fire if you're bad, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not like David Koresh and like the Branch Davidians, mm -hmm. the whole Waco uh, siege and everything um but like you mentioned jehovah's witness earlier like i'd be tempted to perhaps liken it more sort of to jehovah's witnesses so not in terms of like the beliefs um per se i mean i can't actually speak to what jehovah's witness like really believe in but more of the fact that they started as, as a jehovah's witness and scientology also for that matter it started as a movement they're now established religions they have outlived their founders now but there are a few elements in inc that for me and i have to emphasize this is for me um, set it apart from like a quote unquote uh, normal religion. Mm -hmm. And I think the question I went off on a tangent a bit there. No, that's 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 brilliant. And I, I and it's and it's uh, there's a few things that, that you said there that I think are important. Um, mm. Your narrative around knowing at a, an early age that mm. something wasn't quite right. Mm not not maybe not just with the movement itself but with your belief system or mm. with you personally um that that is often quite common with people I speak with that have okay. that have been born into their movements and kind of realized at an early age that something didn't quite sit right with them mm. um even if it didn't seem to phase other family members but I know that's often mm. a conversation that you wouldn't have anyway um yeah you wouldn't want to sit down at six years old and say you know to, to your mum or dad like I don't believe any of that stuff that we've just listened mm. to at that service um mm -hmm. but then kind of give it all or nothing in the teenage years mm. you know and, and tr really try and throw throw themselves in or um have a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex in hopes that they can um 
change their sexuality and mm. stay a part of that religion and then and then just realize mm. that it, it 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 just doesn't uh, it just doesn't work and then eventually yeah. you reach that point where you say okay well um I need to try and have a life outside of this to see if, yes. if it can be any better so what you've said there is is definitely um universal I would say across second third fourth generation members who have who have had those thoughts of something's Mm. not right but at the same time you mentioned there about you know cults versus religions and Mm. and there's often there's often another um definition of of a cult and that is anything that 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 differs from mainstream christianity Mm. um or orthodox christianity Mm. so not recognizing the holy trinity in Mm. itself would make inc in the eyes of you know sort of the the major christian Mm. denominations um would look at inc and say well that's a cult because you know the holy trinity is obviously a sacred part of our doctrine and our dogma um and then the way that we look at cults and high control movements here on the podcast is kind of the spiritual social side of things and Mm. how different control techniques are used to uh, manipulate and coerce members of of the congregation so that is what I'm I'm really interested in in kind of hearing about Um, and I'm sure that there is a lot of pressure from your practicing family members to keep coming back to you and and attempting to get you back on board um, from people in higher positions um yeah I mean, they probably um, have those conversations um do you think that's something yeah. that happens I, I I yeah I do actually um I don't know how long it's been going on um but yeah we had like a, a family um incident earlier in the year where um there were like group prayers and stuff and um yeah it was a I say family incident there was a, we, we lost a family member in February and um that they, they were a practicing member and out of support for the parent that is um, still in the church, mm-hmm. um, I attended the group prayer. Um, and then I was checking on my parent and saying, um, like, are, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Um, how, are you getting bereavement counseling, like offered like on the NHS, et cetera, et cetera. And they said to me that they have their, their, their church um, and they're get, giving them spiritual support. And that um, the um, ministers, I think that's what they said, the ministers would like to meet me because they only know me by name. I never met the ministers because I just did not entertain that thought at all. In fact, I just, Mm. I just ignored that. I just pretended that I didn't see that even, and I I felt really bad because I obviously like my parent was like grieving and everything, but I just, I just, I need to put myself first here. I, because the the minute I step back into that, it's just like, I won't get pulled back in. Like never, I will never ever Mm -hmm. get pulled back Mm -hmm. in, but it will just cause so much tension um, within the family. And I, I know that what I would have said to the ministers that would have then reflected back on my parent which it absolutely should not do because I'm my own individual person. Absolutely, and yeah. like, you know, my parents, you know, they, they raised me and everything, but they're not now responsible for like what I say is like an adult person, an adult woman that makes her own decisions and everything. I was going to say yeah. as well, as a woman who I'm guessing if you went to entertain those people would all be men. Yes, they would. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's no women. So a kind of strong willed woman who says like, you know, I appreciate you taking care of my parent, but I'm not interested in anything Mm. that you have to sell me today. Mm. Mm. Um, Even more so could have a a detrimental effect on how Mm. your parent is, is treated or viewed. Yeah, yeah. I've, actually, I've actually never thought about it that way. But yeah, like women are, see, that it's not blatantly said women are inferior to men, but that's certainly the, the, the impression that I remember. I mean, it has been nearly 20 years since I've um, been out now, but, you know, men and women are separated at service because we're apparently distractions. <laughs> just, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. And I think back on it, like, I'm just smiling. And like, even boys and girls are separated in the children's worship service as well um I just I just don't know why I remember going to like a couple I remember going to my friend's confirmation and when she was um she was Anglican um and she converted quite late like she was 16 um this is a friend I knew from school like she she was never ever in the the, the church I grew up in um but she decided you know like I've um attended a few services and I I want to 
get it confirmed. And I was like, okay, cool. We all went with her for support. And it was just like such a different atmosphere. It was such a different atmosphere. We went in there, we were just sitting with people of both sexes and we were just like, this is just happy. And then yeah. at the end of the service, everyone turned around and like shook hands and everything and introduced each other, which apparently was like really stand. I mean, I don't know. I've only been to like two Anglican services, I think. Um, and then um, I just contrasted that with like where I've been going for years and years and years since birth. And I was just like, something just, I mean, that was just like even more evidence where like, this is just, yeah, it's not right. It's not right. Why, why does everything have to be about, because you use the word control and that's exactly what it was. It's, it's so many tactics. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of makes you already start to realize that there's probably no, if, if, if INC is patriarchal in that way, and you know a maybe not oppressive of women but definitely kind of not not equal to women and no, yeah, making exactly. men and women sit opposite each other mm. and not interact with each other because women mm. are a distraction straight away that that brings into question how the lgbtqia community is seen because mm. there could be two men sitting next to each other that have physical yeah, attraction exactly. to one another um, but that's yeah. obviously something that's not being considered as possible within INC. Oh, yeah. So this is one of the major, major reasons um, why I actually chose to speak out about it. Because I, I mean, I was thinking about it uh, ever since I saw your post in the red in the subreddit, um, and I just thought, no, because the, 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 the treatment of people that are just like non-heterosexual is just well, not the treatment, but the the way that people the, the way that they're spoken about. So I've never seen somebody like treated as in like with disdain or anything. Like I, I'm sh sure that I'm absolutely convinced that that happens. But I remember being in a service when I was, I must've been about 16, maybe even 15. And this, the beliefs were stone age. So we're going back to like the mid nineties here. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't remember like the contents of the actual service. I don't remember like what Bible verses were quoted because I just used to honestly just used to switch off by that point. I just trained myself really well to just sit there for 40 minutes and just not, not listen. But I remember this bit where there was a minister up there talking about, um, yeah, gay people and we need to talk them back on track. And I just remember thinking, what do you mean? Like, and I wish to this day that I'd had the guts to stand up in the middle of that and just say like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. What do you mean talk them back on track? I mean, like, sorry, so this is a choice? This is, I mean, what next? Like conversion therapy? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, I actually do know of somebody that's excommunicated rather publicly, actually, after coming out. Um, it wasn't in the UK. Um, it was a, um, a completely different continent. Um, and people were actually instructed to shun him. So I didn't, so I mentioned earlier that, oh, you know, like they don't practice shunning or anything, but this time they did. I mean, he was the child of a minister. Um, luckily his parents, um, including the minister, like they supported him and everything. I'm, I want to be like very, very careful here. Like he's quite public about it. Um, okay, yeah. I just, I, I don't want to kind of like give anything away because I, I don't know him incredibly well. Um, but I do know, um, and this is, I know third party as well, that um, people were instructed, yeah, you don't don't speak to him anymore just for you know he he had a preference for men like who who'd have thought it my goodness and you know I've got another friend who is attracted to the same sex um they have come out um to their parents and one of them still hasn't spoken to them um that's not in the UK either um but it doesn't even matter it's just, it doesn't matter what country I just I just no. I don't get it. it it is a western country though which is like not to sound patronizing but it is that's more shocking for me I think probably because like I come from western society and everything and you know um you know I was born in the 80s so it, it's not like I'm like really young and like super woke or anything but um people are you know I just like you treat people as equals no matter what their sexuality you know? yeah I, just, and I, just, I just find it insane it's interesting that the INC have this new kind of policy where they want to recruit six new people for every mm. church building, mm. but they are so behind in the way that they treat the members of their congregation. Like yeah. Women are striving for things like equal pay. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're moving into Pride Month tomorrow. Mm. 
which is obviously a huge iconic political Mm -hmm. movement that's been happening for decades now Mm. um and it's it's almost like it's almost like saying to somebody hey do you want to want to step back in time a hundred years and come and come and uh and entertain our our really old-fashioned ways and it's like no i don't we yeah we, we why would we make all this progress to just take 50 steps back that doesn't and it never yeah. makes sense to me. I always find it so strange, especially with these different religious denominations who mm. kind of all, I don't know why anybody would want to, it's hard, it's hard, especially, especially, you know, when, when you're born into these movements. Um, yeah, definitely. But, but you mentioned before about a friend at school um, mm. who, who, who was Anglican. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, so did you go to public school and and attend a public school with kind of different religious oh yeah people around you they practice different different denominations of christianity and whatnot yeah so we i I grew up in um a very like multi-ethnic area so um yeah that we we, there there was christianity sikhism um hinduism islam yeah every everything that you can think of really um and my friend, I, I, I say that she confessed to Anglicanism. I think that she'd like been going to church, you know, like you go to like mass, like midnight mm-hmm. mass at Christmas and maybe you go to ch- a church service at Easter or something. But she actually thought, OK, I, she, she's actually started to go a bit more regularly. And then in the end, she's like, OK, but I want to become a full blown member of the Anglican church. And yeah, so she, she went and did that. Yeah. And that's that's cool that somebody can make that decision on their own as well. She did it on her own. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and it's she nice to, today, yeah. You speak about her quite fondly and as a friend. Mm-hmm. So it's nice that you, that you were able to have those interactions with people outside of your particular movement growing up. Oh yeah, yeah. I, be, I mean, like me even being in another church would be considered heresy. I think, um, like as a child, um, I, I was a member of the Brownie Guides, and um, there was this thing. Called, I don't even. The, I think Brownie sticks. <laughs> I'm so old. Uh, um, there was this thing called church parade and so yeah it took place in methodist church i think the method yeah uh, yeah it was methodist um and i remember like with brownies and cubs and guides there was this um with church parade it would be three of you i think um who would carry the flag and it would just be like this brownie flag with i can't even remember what was on it but I was what eight years old, nine years old, maybe. And I really wanted to be part of that because it was cool. Like all my friends were doing it and everything like, you know, like what, what kids are like and everything. Um, and so I actually remember practicing because I, I didn't really know that I wouldn't be allowed to. So I remember practicing when we were actually at like a Brownie guides, what would you call it? Like, gathering or whatever, just like on a normal Thursday evening. And so there was me and my like, two of my friends were practicing um, church parade, like carrying the, how the flag would feel and everything. And then when it actually came to me doing it, like on the actual Sunday, I was just told, no, you're not allowed. Um, and I never really understood. Like now, obviously, now I understand why. It's because it's not, not a real church, um, according to my parent that is still in INC. Um, but I was heartbroken. I remember that. I was just thinking, but, you know, my friends are doing it. And then I remember thinking, you know, I'm letting everyone down because there needs to be three of us. Now there's only going to be two. And I didn't know that I wasn't going to be doing it. So... Um, I can't remember where I came from. Sorry, I'm like going off on a tangent. Like once again. No, no. Um, I, honestly, it's 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 all of this is is part of your story <laughs> and and contributes towards people understanding the different experiences that people can have growing up in, yeah. in these types of movements. And yeah. it just makes me wonder: Were you sort of um, in school like a? Um, Oh, what's the word when you're the smaller percentage oh like minority or... yeah so would INC have been a minority in your school a minority Ooh, very in religion? much so. very very much so I mean in the Philippines it wouldn't have been unusual because in the Philippines it's the third largest religion after Catholicism which is by far the biggest one then Islam and then it's INC um but in the UK like it's unheard of is absolutely unheard of and I think especially when I was at school where there, I think there were only two branches um and they eventually added a third now it's it's a bit bigger but I still think I don't think unless you live in an area where there's like a strong Filipino contingent 
um, which I mean, whilst I lived in a multi-ethnic area, there were, I was, I think my family were probably one of the only Filipino families. So yeah, nobody would have heard of it at all. That's so interesting for somebody in their native country to yeah <laughs> uh, to be part of a religious movement that that came from overseas yeah and but is the minority in your school yeah. that's that's yeah. absolutely fascinating and uh, what about the con- your congregation size i mean how many people would there be when you would go to services how often did services happen did you have a church building what what did all of that Oof. look like so yes we had a church building um I actually remember when it was um, built, well, rather they, they, they purchased like an old church and then um, first thing they did was like tear the cross down because you're not allowed to have a cross there. Um, so that, that's, that was one thing where I was just like, oh, maybe there is a bit of a culty kind of feel about it because like in every single Christian uh, church I'd been in before, there was like a cross and in Catholic churches, it's a, like Jesus was hanging from it, so it was the actual crucifix. Um, yeah, so they, I remember them building the church um, I can't tell you what the pop, what the um, population would have been or the number of how large a congregation was, sorry. Um, but it, I remember it was packed every single week. In terms of like the frequency of services, it was twice a week, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Um, and you had to turn an attendance card. So this is the thing about, this for me was like really weird. You had to turn an attendance card before you went and took your seat. Um, and then if your attendance card wasn't turned, your name would go down in a book. And then every week you would have, I think it was every week. Yes, it was every week or every two weeks. I can't remember. Um, but you would have um, what's called like church committee meetings where you'd have um, a small group of people that lived in your area. Um, our, our area was called out of states. Um, and you would have people that, yeah, so you gather around somebody's house and you'd ha- it was like, a, it was sort of like a social thing, but then, there'd be like a committee group overseer who would then take the names, they, they would have the names written down of those people that hadn't attended the last service or last couple of services. And then we had to give the reason why. And so even though I was a child, my name would go down in a book as well because my attendance side would have been turned. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the reason why I would, so if, if my parents were working or something, because they worked, they, they had jobs which were required shift work and, um, if they were working and it just could, they couldn't go, then obviously like me and my sibling couldn't go because it was, it wasn't local. It was a driveway. It's like a half an hour driveway where we had to, where we had mm-hmm. to go. Um, and so the reason for me would be hindered. So you would have gone, but you couldn't. And <laughs> I was a teenager, like a, a, this, yeah. When I say child, I was like probably 15, 16. Where I remember just like getting really, really hacks off with this. And I was just like, well, I didn't, yeah, I just didn't go. I could have taken public transport if I'd really, really wanted to get there. I could have done but I, I just I really didn't and I was always really pleased when um I had to be secretly pleased when my parents couldn't drive us there because I was just like oh thank goodness I actually get to stay in and if it was a Wednesday I get to watch I don't know Coronation Street or something which I don't even like <laughs> but you know I get to I get to do that and maybe do some homework as well you know and I I, I asked um I asked the previous person I spoke to about this about this movement um mm-hmm if your name was written in that book mm. that you didn't attend, was it common mm. that your family would be contacted and asked why you weren't at the meeting? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, cause I always used to, we actually had one of our overseers was actually related to one of my parents. So um, I think they just used to take it kind of like off record. Maybe I'm not sure. Um, but I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what happened because when I left, um, I so university basically was my exit strategy that was when I was like okay right I've Mm -hmm. actually got Mm -hmm. this chance that I can see a window's open and that window was university and I wasn't actually quote unquote allowed to go to my university like a university in the north of England because I lived in the south um which I can go into a little bit afterwards but um yeah, I remember, I remember using like my final year as an excuse. Like, oh, you know, I've just got so much work. Um, I'm going to stay up here for the weekend instead of coming home. And so I did it very, I did it like a gradual phase out. So I, one Sunday I just decided, nope, I'm not coming home. So I was just like, yeah, you know, I've got a lot of work on and I'm, 
I'm going to stay here and get it done. When in reality, I was like going out to the student union and you know, just being a student, I was just being yeah, a normal yeah. student that just wanted to go out. And sometimes I used to just, sometimes I just stayed in and because I, that was the freedom that I had. And then, um, then I just ramped it up ever so gradually. So then it would be like every three Sundays that I wouldn't go. And then every two Sundays and then eventually like every Sunday that I wouldn't go. And eventually what I said was, you know, well, I need to actually work Sundays because I need to pay my way through X, Y, and Z. I need to buy textbooks or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then I just, I never went back. So I think I was, I was actually writing this down in my notes. I was just, I've always wondered whether that's like a really cowardly way to get out of it. But I just think there's, there's no real easy way. I would love to have that kind of like mic drop moment where I just kind of like announced to everyone, like, this is the reason I'm leaving. And I, I can't do it off cuff, but <laughs> so I, I, I'm not leaving. I'm not staying because of like X, Y, Z and you, 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 and you can go and do this, 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 and this mic drop go. I would love that Hollywood moment, but in reality, it just doesn't happen like that. And I was just, I was, I'm, you know, even before I agreed to this podcast, I was like really kind of worried about like potential repercussions not that people would be violent against me, but like the questioning and the guilt and everything. And then that's when I knew, or that's what, not when I knew, but that's when I really, really realized, okay, but this is definitely like a cult thing. Like if I am scared about going on a podcast um, to just to talk about like my own experiences, and I, I don't think I've been bashing anyone like um, throughout this conversation, like at all. No. Um, I've, and I've really tried to be very careful to kind of protect um, identities as those people that I know. Even that, I, even though I was... Um, very careful to do that I'm just I, I was still kind of like oh god like what's going to happen after this etc so yeah that, that's a definite sign to me that I'm doing the right thing a quick word from our sponsors it's scary time lock your doors check under your bed and turn on a nightlight because it's time for the scariest stories, history and conversations you've ever heard. The Indie Drop-In Network is bringing you special content. Every week an independent creator tells us about the paranormal, ghosts, monsters, hauntings, creepy places, enchanted objects, aliens and more. Best of all, if you like the creator, you can follow them for more great content, if you dare. One episode by one particular show called Hidden in the Shadows is a deep dive into the legend of the black-eyed children and the terrifying encounters some people have had. Listen to Scary Time on Apple Podcasts today or follow the link in the show description to find out more. It can't be easy spending that amount of time in a situation where you feel like you have to zone out and train yourself to basically like become vacant Mm. um no especially during the years where you're supposed to be kind of sponge like absorbing everything that's going on around you and so what what do you think it was like for children growing up in INC were you were you kind of um were you encouraged to kind of get to know each other and spend time with each other and have the opportunity to to have like child's play and freedom or was it very much sort of like sit down be quiet and learn the 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 scripture of of our people yeah so in terms of like so when we were there were children's worship services um and it we were never told like you must never have friends outside or anything I think they're they're intelligent enough to know that like kids are going to have friends outside the church and everything plus you know this is me being completely cynical and it's nothing that was told to us or anything but like you know like when they grow up and everything you always bring those friends into INC and then we get more converts so hurrah um again there's nothing they told us it's just that's just like a conclusion I came up with um but they never told us like you can't socialize with other kids or anything um but when we were in children's worship service we would have like this sheet under our seats even if you couldn't read if you couldn't read you had to sit with like a what what we would call officers so uh, it would be like a a young adult like either an older teenager or a a very young adult in their 20s um who would be like basically like a deacon or deaconess um if you couldn't read 
then they had to go and sit with you and then you had to read it to them. And what these sheets of what these sheets of paper were, there was quite it was Q and A basically. So they would have a, a, a question. Um, it would be about like say Noah's Ark. This is the one that I remember quite well. Um, I remember being taught in school about Noah's Ark. The animals went in two by two, hurrah, hurrah, etc. And it was all like very lovely and everything. We, you know, we learned that there was a flood, but we also learned about the rainbow and it would never happen again and everyone's happy. But in um, in children's worship service, they were very focused on the hellfire and brimstone aspect of it. You know, we were we, it, with Noah's Ark. We learned about God's wrath, and so there's a question about it. Oh, this would be such a better example if I could remember an actual question. Um, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, it's off the top of my head, so this isn't um, a direct quote from the church. Right. So j- just say, for example, the first question there I said, so um, why did God send a flood? And the answer would be because God believed that all the people had sinned and needed to be like basically needed to scrap the earth and start it again. They would put it very differently. Um but for a child to listen to that sort of thing, and as you say, like when you're at that age and that you just, you're a sponge and absorbing all this sort of mm-hmm, information mm-hmm. is dangerous. So, uh, yeah, it's very scary. Yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, the one bit of hope I have is that, you know, I was able to see through a lot of it when I was still a young child. I, don't get me wrong, I was terrified of Noah's Ark. That story messed me up for um, probably about a year or so. Um, and the reason I use Noah's Ark is because they were, they were, as I say, they were very, very focused on God's wrath and God flooded the earth and killed everyone, killed all the sinners and everything. They had the rainbow um, at the end. You know, God promised it would never do it again, but basically never sin because it, it mm-hmm. can't happen again. And I remember being in ballet class one time. It was a Saturday and um, yeah, it was like in the late 80s. And so there was like double glazing wasn't as common as it is now. And there was thunder and lightning and hailstones. And I remember hearing glass cracking upstairs. So it's because the reason I mentioned single glazing is because like the w- windows just easily shattered because of how like this really strong hailstones and everything. I remember this older girl um, in ballet class just saying to me, oh, it's a flood. And I said, no, 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 Flood- <laughs> floods don't happen anymore. And she said, no, it's a flood outside. And I was terrified and I cannot Aww. have been older than six or seven probably set maybe more like seven or eight actually but it doesn't like, I was very very young and then my parent one of my parents came to pick me up and um it was raining so so heavily and you know you know it's raining heavily and you know that it is a flood it, it, um in, in some areas and like we live in it I think what had happened like the drains just couldn't cope with like the level yeah. of water and so you know it's like huge huge puddles so I was just terrified because I've never seen anything like it before and in my head I had it's a flood and I screamed all the way home which must have been about a 10 minute drive and my parent kept asking what's wrong what's wrong and I said well God promised this would never happen again I was screaming it I remember sitting in the middle of the car um hands over my ears screaming because I was so terrified and my parent was laughing and wow, okay. I, I, I yeah. just was like, why, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? And it's because I knew that obviously it wasn't true that, you know, this, this, this was just a storm, but I was so scared. I was so, so scared. And then when I confronted them, I don't know when I confronted them, but I was much, much older. I, I said like, well, why did you laugh? Do you remember when I did that? Why did you laugh? And they said, because I thought it was rather sweet. And now I have no problem with this parent like now, but at the time, I still like when I think back on that I'm just like I just I cannot believe that that's what the answer was yeah um I because I would say if that had been my my eldest kid now there's no way I would have been laughing when he if he's that scared no I know it's not he's not going to get harmed and obviously my parent knew I wasn't going to get harmed I wasn't going to be washed away in a flood like I thought but you know, I, I remember that really, really messed me up. And I remember drawing. Um, so we used to have a group of mums that came into school to help us with our reading, with our maths, etc. And so we had to draw thank you cards for them. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to use Noah's Ark as a theme. If every, a normal child, I was a normal child, but um, a child that had learned um, Noah's Ark in like the standard way, um, would have drawn like, an ark and then two animals. Oh, there's two elephants. That's so cute. And oh, look, two kittens. Oh, how lovely. I drew loads of dead people at the bottom of the sea with like, you know, the crossed eyes that you do for like, if somebody's dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's what I drew. And I took it to my teacher and they were just like, I'm not quite sure, like very British. I'm not quite sure that's what they're going for. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'll just color the lightning in different then. And I, did, I look back at that now and I'm just like, oh man. 
again, I was around about the same age, but that story just, it, it messed me up so much. Yeah, and it makes me wonder if some parents would have had a different reaction mm. at that point and and almost had like a, oh my goodness, what, what are these stories doing mm. to my child's kind of psychology? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, in that movement, and obviously I can't say this for certain, but it's just based on people that I know, because um, a lot of people that I know were like born into it and everything. Unfortunately, for that generation at least, I think the reaction, whilst it might not have been laughter, it might have been, oh, that's really cute still. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because they're that far gone. They, they were brainwashed as well when they were kids. And so that, but they never were able to think critically. And I don't know how much of that is to do with like being in the Philippines, because I know that it is harder um, in the Philippines. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my, I, mean I, I know that I was very lucky to grow up in a society where, you know, I could basically disappear out of it. In the Philippines, it's, it's, it's not that easy. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't have the first kind of inkling about culture and and society um over in that part of the world so no. I can't even sit here and speculate um yeah but you mentioned that you know interacting with other children could be a mm. way to bring new families into the church so mm. it was kind of not discouraged uh for you to kind of build bonds and friendships mm. what what other types of fundraising or recruitment does the church mm. use to bring people in or fund itself yeah so the the, the thing I said about like uh, making friends with the kids to um, use them as recruits that's that's purely my um very cynical self thinking yeah, that that's yeah. why they allow it so it, it, that's nothing that we were ever told or anything we did right. not, not advise that as a strategy so that's, that's d definitely um just coming from my head in terms of like fundraising etc um i think they've ramped it up in recent years um but yeah like they, they have these things called offering or in the philippines it's called abuloy um where it's just you give um a certain um a, any amount that you like um to the church every service so every Sunday, every Wednesday, or whenever your services are, you give an offering and then that offering is to God, but it goes into funding, like the building of new, new um, churches, et cetera. Um, and I've been, I, I don't know whether they're, I don't think they're funded by the government. I don't think so. Um, yeah, my knowledge on funding is like very, very um, patchy. So um, I'm not the best person to ask about that part at all. Um, but I do know that it's, there are, two thanksgivings i think i think it's mid-year thanksgiving and then proper thanksgiving and then holy supper as well where you're expected to kind of like give just a bit more um i mean my offering was like a, a pound a week oh no so it would have been two pounds because it would have been like wednesday and a sunday and so then you add that up over time um i mean it's not that much of course it's like what eight quid a week something like that um, I don't know how much we go for Holy Supper and the, the other bigger services. Um, but I remember, I, I remember I was actually an officer in the children's um, worship service. The reason I did it is not because like, I really believed in it and really wanted to get the kids to really believe in it, but it's because I wanted to get out of the adult service and I just wanted to like play with the kids and, um, everything. And sometimes I, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's what I got out of that. And, but I remember, um, collecting money from from the kids and some there was, there was somebody that would always give like a five pound note and I, it's only now when I look back and I'm just like I don't know whether their parents could actually afford to part with that every single week um like times it by the number of siblings they had and then their parents as well um I mean, obviously you know, you, you, I'm not going to be a person to say oh my goodness like you should never give money you should never it's your money you do what you want with it in my opinion but you kind of I know that there's a pressure um, there must it must have been like a huge pressure for the adults as well um, to like give give more give more especially when it comes to like the bigger services like give more because we're thanking God here come on like God yeah. gave you life and all of that sort of stuff um, so yeah that so that's not fundraising um, per se it's literally just getting like members to donate um, so yeah and. The person I interviewed previously mentioned that the the children's group that you were a part of, and mm. then and then um, would sometimes have to miss later because your parents 
were, were had shift work commitments mm. um you would be expected to 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 take a small donation as a child as well and yeah. pass that pass that over when you attended yeah. the kids group yes yes so yeah my parents would just give me like a, a pound before I went in and then yeah that was it yeah that, so that, that, that didn't come out of my pocket money or anything that was like something right. extra that my, my parents gave me yeah okay okay that's that's good that it, it didn't come out of, it, of any of your personal allowance yeah. um and the overseer role that you mentioned there's several other roles that you can that you can have when mm. within the congregation is it does does it work like that over here as well yeah so there's um yeah they're, they're called offices um so there you can become a choir member even if you want to play i, I remember because i um yeah, I remember I wanted to have a go at playing the organ, but to do that, you need to become a choir member and go through this whole shebang uh, to do that. Um, I've only been, I only went to like a couple of choir practice rehearsals and I was like, I, I just, I can't right now. And it's, it's such a long practice. It's so long um, and really boring as well. Um, you can become a member of the secretariat. I actually don't know what they do. Um, I assume just like a lot of church administration uh, type work. Um, there's finances or like the treasury and you can become a deacon or a deaconess um, which is on the face of it you basically stand at the end of each pew and hand out hymn books and collect the money from people and then hand that into the um, hand it into the big collection box at the end and then with with deacons only men can get this as well so um, with deacons you can kind of like uh, get promoted um, in a way and become like a head deacon I don't know how on earth um, you fulfill that criteria but you can um, and that means that you get to go up on on I was gonna say like on stage not on stage but like you get to go up with the minister and like lead the lead the prayers and everything on um yeah before the service starts etc i think you get to do do you get to do the closing prayer i can't remember but yeah there's some that's one of the perks that comes with it um and yeah then there's children's worship service and children's choir etc but um yeah those are the offices um that that you can hold they're unpaid as far as i know i mean when i was like when i was an officer um, it was definitely unpaid but Mike, if you make a mistake um, i remember like making a mistake when i was counting and uh, doing the counting for the children's service so i collected the money and then i had to count it with the rest of um, the team and i wrote something like a 5 instead of a 2 and i was like okay well i'll just go, I'll, I'll just write i'll just cross that out and write a 2 but my god it was like the biggest deal ever i had to write an apology to the church administration that i made a mistake and oh, everything and i apologized and i was just that got me so stressed about doing it again and it was it was ridiculous i look back on it now and like why did you get so stressed with that but i get that like, when you're in the moment and you've just got all this just like oh my goodness you made a mistake okay you need to write a letter saying that you're very sorry it won't happen again blah 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 and now i look back on that and i'm like if i could go back to that girl then with the knowledge that i have now <laughs> this i would handle it very, very differently yeah yeah and uh, i mean it, it makes you wonder how many other people have had those experiences of feeling yeah, like they've done something wrong and need to apologize profusely. And then the, the lengths that some committed members will go to, to try and rectify that or prove their oh, kind of goodness. their allegiance to the church yes. through any means necessary. Like, can I do yeah. this? Can I do that? Can mm. I donate more hours? Can I, you know, mm. ca can I become more involved in the church? Because yeah you're telling me I've done something wrong and I want to prove to you that I haven't and and it just yeah. it kind of all goes around in a big circle then doesn't it yeah oh god oh god yeah completely and I think that it's interesting you mentioned like people would do anything to like show their allegiance and everything I have a family member um who, we we were on a family holiday together um in the Philippines and um we wanted to take a family photo and but so just a bit tiny bit of background you're not actually allowed to drink alcohol in the church so many people do so there's so much hypocrisy that goes on within the followers mm -hmm. um but what you know like i we were having a really nice time we were just having um just a couple of bottles of sandwich like, nobody was getting drunk it was just like we had a bottle of beer each and then there's a family member there. We wanted to take a family photo. And this family member said, but we, we need all the beer bottles out of the photo, every single one, um, because I don't want to be pictured with them. 
and I was thinking, okay, uh, and my family member, she, she had a, um, she had a high, like quite a high office. I was like, okay, I'll benefit of the doubt. All right, fair enough. Let's clear it. Okay, whatever. But then she would talk about like um, how she would go for a pub lunch with um, some of her colleagues and um, she wouldn't want to sit with them if they were in I can't remember either she didn't either she didn't want to sit with them inside the pub because it was a pub so she would sit outside um or she just didn't want to sit with them if they were drinking alcohol something like that but whatever it was like you don't have to drink alcohol yourself you know um but it was it that was very sad but she had she felt the need to speak about that and I always wondered like why and you know I happen to know she wasn't like a wild child or anything like she was very devoted um to to her duties like very very devoted um I don't know why that she felt the need to kind of announce because she did that more than once and I was just thinking this is very odd um, I got paranoid at one point so it's because like, she knows that I'm like living um like a, a quote-unquote bad life I'm going out and being like a teenager and drinking with my friends yeah um I don't know I, I still don't know uh, so in terms of alcohol being a restriction within Mm. the religion is there anything else in terms of clothing or food or or um leisure activities and things like that that are seen as as something that shouldn't be done within within the church yeah so I mean I mentioned church parade earlier which I absolutely wasn't allowed to do now I know why when I look back on it um clothing yeah I, I was told off once for wearing um I was told off a couple of times actually so one time I was told off for wearing culottes so like those trousers that like kind of look like a skirt so it was the 90s they were like a thing then and mm-hmm. everything um so I was told off for wearing those because it wasn't a proper skirt um I don't think that was by an officer to be fair that was just by another member and um, my nail var- color of my nail varnish got commented on a couple of times again not by an officer per se but by other members like why are you wearing blue nail varnish it's you know whatever so that wasn't like a restriction more of a just the society that that society right. being like yeah. quite judgmental um but I remember once being ch- asked to change into a skirt in my own house um so I, I would have been a teenager I was still living at home and one of, it was one of those overseer meetings I was telling you about earlier um so the whole whole gang was round and everything um I was wearing trousers I wasn't dressed like um untied I, I, I wasn't like looking unkempt or anything I just happened to have jeans on or a pair mm-hmm. of trousers. Mm-hmm. And I got told in my own house by someone who'd never been there before, um, ha- have you got a skirt that you can go and change into? No. Yeah. yeah. In your own home? Yeah. I mean, it was t- obviously like not technically my home because I don't own it, blah, 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 blah. But yeah. Um, but it is your home if you're a, if yeah. you're a child of if the I parents live there, yeah. who live there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Someone walks yeah. into your house and says, no, nah, you should go and get changed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know yeah. about that. I... Yeah, it was, it was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I, I, you know, I did it because like my, my, one of my parents was just like, oh, just go and do it just because it's easier. And I think like it would have looked bad on them too. Um, but they get you like that. He's just like, oh, bring shame on, on, on your, on your mum and dad and all of that. And that's how they keep a lot of them in. I swear. Um, it, it's just all this guilt so much guilt. And like, we talked about control as well. And that, that that's um, very much a, yeah all, all of all of that. that that's just that's an example of control as well just like oh you know you you, you can't wear uh, trousers in your own house and then like m- one of my parents just felt the need to just oh just please please go and do it I don't I can't be bothered with the conversation oh, like, right no now. Yeah, that's just, yeah. awful then that you don't have the oh yeah, yeah. the backup not, from, not, from your parental yeah. figure yeah. so yeah. Um, we we talked briefly about the the kind of the, the LGBT mm. views being one of the reasons why you kind of m- more distanced yourself from yeah. the church. But were there any notable experiences or anything that happened to reinforce you not mm. wanting to be a part of, of the movement anymore? Oh, there were lots. Yeah. I mean, so the one that happened, the, the, the moment when I was six years old, because I said to you earlier that I knew that I wanted to leave since I was six years old. That was when they told me that we don't celebrate Christmas. We always had like a Christmas tree in my house growing up. Like we didn't go to like midnight mass or anything, um, but we always had like Christmas tree. We had Christmas presents. We, my, uh, my sibling and I, we believed in Santa Claus. Um, and then when I heard like, we don't celebrate Christmas, I was like, well, hang on a second. No, no, yes, we do. Um, and I remember being shamed. This is, like, this is the first notable moment for me. 
that I remember. Um, I remember being shamed in the middle of a children's worship service, me and my sibling. Um, and I remember the teacher saying, so who has a Christmas tree? Uh, me and my sibling just put our hands up because we were six or seven years oh, old. And, and we excited. And excited. you've been decorating your house. And that's, yep. oh. Yeah. And I'll never, ever forget the look on the teacher's face. I'll never, ever forget that. And I just, I remember my sibling just looked at me. They're younger than me. And they looked at me just completely confused. Like, why has nobody else got their hand up? Like, why does this feel wrong? And I remember realizing then, like, that is, no, no, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. And then like, who believes in Father Christmas? My sibling, like, sh- like they're much younger. And so they straight up with a hand. And like, still to this day, I remember just being like, oh, I just, I wish that I could go back in time and just like hug those two and just tell them you didn't do anything wrong. You had a good Christmas. You know, Christmas is always really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. That was the first moment. And then uh, I don't I, I don't know where the last person you spoke to about this movement was based, but uh, block voting was uh, a massive thing. So they do that a lot in the Philippines. They've actually got quite a lot of political influence in the Philippines um, because you don't vote according to like who you believe in individually. Like that would be ridiculous. <laughs> you get told who to vote for. Um, it's quite controversial in the Philippines, in my opinion, because they've, the INC have actually endorsed two quite controversial um, presidents. Um, one of them being Marcos and the latest one being Duterte. Um, I, I mean, I don't know um, enough about uh, the, the politics in the Philippines to even pretend that I can start to commentate on like whether the policies like, um, yeah, yeah. like, you know, like how controversial they are, but like, everyone knows like Marcos, you know, martial law and that, like <laughs> there are con- certainly controversies there and like Duterte with like his um, war on drugs and everything, but they're fully endorsed by INC. And if you have like a religion that has got, I can't remember the percentage, but the third largest in the Philippines, that's, that can actually sway it quite significantly. Um, that, that, that can actually influence like who gets picked to be president of, of the country. And if, we, if they had that power and yeah, that, that, that just doesn't sit right. And they used to try and do that um, in the UK as well. I remember being very excited. Okay, I'm about to vote for the first time. And then you get told, like, well, you're voting for this person. I was like, no, I'm not. And I didn't. Like, of course, like, what are they going to do? Like, come with me to the ballot booth and, like, check who I put, like, the X in the box for? No, of course not. But um, we were just taught, you know, but this isn't about voting. It's about unity. It's just like, but no, it's not. This is about you trying to control me. Um, I don't know quite, I don't quite know how they wanted to try and, like, control, like, the individual I, I think that the people that were born into it for some reason just felt compelled to go along with it. I just, yeah, I just never yeah. did. I just never, ever did. Um, and again, I think that's an advantage of growing up in Britain as opposed to the Philippines, maybe. That's not to kind of, uh, it sounds like I'm trying to, um, you know, talk down to the Filipino culture. I'm not. It's more like, it's more prevalent in the Philippines. So um, you're not, it's, it's more known. I'm not even sure if I'm making sense there. Yeah, no, um, it definitely, it definitely does make sense. And and I wasn't aware about, uh, uh, aware of the, the situation, the political situation over in mm. the Philippines, but it, it was mentioned in, in, in the last interview mm. I had about this movement. I think I did ask whether INC had some ties to people in mm. politics or positions of power to maintain their religious tax mm. exempt status yeah um, that, so that, that it I sounds now you now you've kind of <laughs> now you've kind of shed some light on it it's almost like a, i'll scratch my back if you i'll scratch your back if, if uh, you scratch mine kind of situation where yeah yeah everyone in inc to vote for a particular political party and they'll make yeah. sure that inc is protected in in some way by, by yeah so I mean I, in, in an official capacity I don't know whether they're like officially connected but it goes without saying that if a p- politician in the Philippines knows the power or the influence that that group can have there's no way that they're not going to be in my opinion there's no way that they're not going to take advantage of that somehow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so you you kind of have had these experiences where you've distanced mm. yourself from the church mm you've used university as a means to kind Mm. of accomplish that and was there ever a a point during those those times where your parents took you to one side or sat you down and said like what are you doing 
are, are you leaving the are you in are you out like did, did was that ever a conversation that came up it wasn't I don't think so if it was I brushed it off because I just knew that I what this wasn't ever going to happen and I think I was just too kind of like focused on the light at the end of the tunnel which was just my exit yeah um I think that one of my parents they were just I remember they were very disappointed um and I kind of made hints um and then when I moved back home briefly after university I was asked oh would you like to come to the grand evangelical mission which is like the it's called something else now I think but the grand evangelical mission is where they try to get like lots of new recruits and everything and it never really works um, at least it didn't at that um in Britain in those days um and I just said no I'm, I'm not coming back um and then there were just there were arguments um about like my choice of lifestyle etc like don't worry about the fact that I was happy well, I was happy, yeah. Like, I don't think I actually, I, I was very confused um, after I left as well in terms of, like, where am I spiritually and everything? Because it actually yeah. did take me a while to land on, like, I'm now atheist, but it took me ages to kind of, like, work out that what, what I was. But I didn't feel repressed anymore. I felt that I could actually try, at least try and find out, like, who the hell I am, <laughs> et cetera, like, outside of this movement, which had repressed... Um, I mean, I was like, I was like living a double life anyway, I guess. Um, I was going out with my friends. I was um, at university. I was staying over at university, which I technically wasn't really allowed to do according to the INC laws and everything. Um, but yeah, but I was still, it, it was tiring having to go twice a week um, when I was still going twice. A week. It was really tiring having to pretend that I was this like really holier than thou person that like was really into it and like believed all this rubbish that they were spouting um, mm -hmm. so when I wasn't doing that anymore that it was just like relief I was going to ask her sort of what life life was like kind of once you'd made that decision to to, to not go back yeah I mean it was exhilarating because I was just like I've finally done it I've, I'm, I've actually finally done it it was I mean, it, you know, I would love to say, yes, it was the best decision. I ever, it was definitely the best decision I made at that time. Um, I would love to say that I've never looked back and I've just been happy and then that's it. But and I am happy. I'm like, you know, I'm happily married now. I've got kids now who I'm like really determined to raise as best possible. I really want to in, instill like the skill of like critical thought into them instead of just like, right, so you will do what I say because I said so kind of thing. Um but it wasn't an easy journey to kind of get there because it was such a huge part of my life for over 20 years. And, you know, yeah, I was repressed. Um, as I say, I was living that double life where I had to pretend and I had to fracture in order to leave. I had to fracture um, a, a few relationships with people, um, like members of my family um, who were like really, really into it. I had to, I had to break those uh, relationships or at least yeah. just not, not see them as much. I used to see them quite often um and that that part was really hard that was really hard because we were all very close when we were growing up and everything and I think like if um, you ask my parent who's still in there if you ask them oh what do you think um Sophia felt like w w when she left oh she probably didn't care she probably felt really happy that like she's just dropped us and everything and that wasn't true at all it was despite the fact that I knew it was the right decision it was still a very hard one to make because I was still very scared there's part of me that was like oh, am I really going to do this? Can I actually do it? Um, what's going to happen to me? And then, you know, the what if they are actually right, you know, because I've been listening to this twice a week for God knows how long. Mm -hmm. And there was, even though I knew in my heart that this is wrong, there was still a part of me that just said, well, I don't know what's going to happen to me after I What if it is right? What if I am going to just like suffer and everything? So, mm -hmm. you know, they get, they did, it did get in my head. It did get in my head. Um, so that, that I went through that for a while and then I just, yeah, I mean, I, I did too much partying like after I, um, after, but that, you know, I was in my early twenties as well. So I probably would have done that anyway. Um, but then I, I switched around between like, oh, so am I, am I religious? No, I don't think so. Because, you know, I, I went to a couple of services with my Anglican friend, I think after that as well. And I just, I, it's not for me, mm -hmm. uh, really isn't for me. Um, but do I have faith? I see faith and religion is quite different I, I think you, ha you, you can't have religion without faith like in, in the traditional sense of religion anyway yeah um, but did I believe in something I, I don't believe in like this omnipotent all-seeing uh, is what omnipotent means is it? <laughs> I don't believe in this like omnipotent deity that um apparently controls everything we do but then like gives us free will and there's also just too much stuff that just doesn't make sense um, yeah yeah 
too much of it. Like, why do kids get critically ill? Um, is actually like they've done nothing wrong? Like, they, what, what are they being punished or something? Like, it, that, that's so. I wasn't happy with that at all. But then spiritually, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually still don't know where I am. Like, in, do I believe in like an afterlife or so? I, I, I haven't really landed on that. But um, I definitely don't believe in a god. So that's why that's why I did. Uh, that's why I define myself as atheist. Mm -hmm. yeah, Especially yeah. because INC is almost a cult of personality as well in terms yeah, of the leader definitely. that is revered mm. um who was a you know who who is a physical being a human yeah. being yeah. um that is perceived as the last you know as you said at the start of, of, of the episode um the like the last line of communication between mm, yeah. um he 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 heaven and earth or or mm. or whichever words people would use to 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 describe it um and i think it's it's almost more dangerous in that sense when it is a person that is that is worshipped on mm. top of a, 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 a person as well that is saying you know let's worship god but actually mm. kind of at the same time we're going to worship me as well oh yeah yeah um yeah that's that's always really hard for me to wrap my head around um, yeah I mean it's kind of ironic because they were we were always told there was a, there's a lot of catholic bashing in this religion as well and I'm sure the person that you spoke to before probably told you that as well like they every service I remember is just like well the catholic church do this so aren't they idiots not in those words but it was that that's what the gist of it was and the catholic church they worship idols like, oh my god like, why do they worship the virgin mary i happen to believe that i i mean i i don't know why people pray to the virgin mary um not just because i'm atheist i'm just like but you know she was apparently just a human i didn't ever get that but still like just have some kind of respect but then they would say that yeah they do that they worship idols they believe in like wearing the cross around your neck is they, they believe sorry that the cross um in a church that's kind of like worshiping an idol but then they go and like um, pray for Felix Manalo and well, sorry, um, what's his grandson's name? Eduardo Manalo is 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 the current executive minister. And it, when I was um, in the church, we always had to pray for Eduardo Manalo. Iranio Manalo was um, Eduardo's father, mm -hmm. and we had to always include them in prayer. So I just about how is that any different? I mean, I it's, it, I mean, I guess like for praying for them, it wasn't like worshiping them, but like we always had to include it, in, include them. It's just, like yeah okay like the executive minister but like if, if we're not supposed to be like worshiping idols yeah or people, I, I, like what why are we why are we doing this like because and, we're placing them in such a massive pedestal it's uh yeah it didn't sit right and i th i think that there was um something that came out about um embezzling as well and um using a lot of church money to buy fancy cars and things like that oh um, yeah so not only are the people's attention thoughts prayers going towards this family who are at the head of this this movement but also their finances as well um yeah which is I, I very sad I, yeah i mean i can't i've actually i've heard of that actually I, I i can't speak too much um to it simply because i don't it happened I think that if this is related to the controversy in 2015, that all happened way, way after I left. So unfortunately, I'm not the best person to speak to about that part at all. But yeah, I mean, I, I've heard like quite a lot of dodgy stuff um, in that regard. Mm -hmm. I wish to God I could comment on that more. And I mean, I guess my, my last question to you before mm. I ask you if there's anything you think we've missed mm. um, is... And, and you, you've, you've touched on this a little bit kind of with your journey through university and, and mm. kind of seeing that as a kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. What advice would you give to people who are in similar situations, have their doubts, are looking for their kind of their opportunity? What, what would be your advice to people who, who are looking to remove themselves from, from their religion? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is just like, be true to yourself just know what your values are outside of the organization um i had to do a lot of soul searching even though i knew from a very early age i still question a lot because you're just getting fed and it, it, it's hard because you're getting fed every two uh, twice a week sorry you're getting fed all of this um 
so yeah just know know who you are and stay true to that and then yeah it is about forming an exit strategy I, and as i said earlier i wish that my exit could have been like right this massive moment it's just a mic drop and then i'm out but it's not easy to do um i saw university as my window opportunity simply because i'd left home um, I know that's not as easy for people to do, like if they have um, not left home, especially, and I, I know that it's higher in the Philippines as well. Um, but if you can, if, if that's what you want, like maybe like break it down. It's a goal, break it down into manageable chunks. So what if the issue is that you can't leave home because of lack of money or something, then I don't know, like, is there even a part-time job that you can get and like start um saving up money um it doesn't have to be that but it's like any any small step that you can think of when you're just trying to break down this like massive overwhelming goal um and then just keep anything that you can do even no matter how small that you can do to get there that then just do it even if you think that it uh, is too little it doesn't matter even like joining the subreddit um is a step in the right direction because there are so many people that have been through i mean this is like really this is very inc specific um yeah but um like it, just going th finding that support group um is invaluable for some people like the only reason i joined it is because like i was get people were trying to recruit me back in and i just googled like why is it so hard to actually leave inc and then i'm so glad i joined because now i've actually spoken to people that are looking to leave and shared my experience and it mm -hmm. has apparently mm -hmm. been helpful but also like find people that you can trust like on the outside lean on them because you will need a support network i think especially if you're in a country where the religion is so prevalent as well again that's very specific to inc but i think it, it, it's um it's relevant to other groups as well um if you have that support network you can lean on it maybe it's online to start with and that's okay it can be difficult just like, i don't know who to if when you're stuck in an organization like, I, I don't know who to trust um especially inc in a, uh, in particular like to use like quite orwellian methods to keep tabs on people i yeah. know that there are people in that subreddit who are members of mm -hmm. inc and i know that they kind of follow people on facebook as well um but once you can find someone that you know you can trust then you know you can lean on them um lean on them as much as possible and find somewhere you can talk like don't keep it in um don't keep it in and if you need somebody to kind of like bounce ideas off on like how do i do it then yeah there are groups out there reddit is probably quite a good um, place to start actually with regards to that. absolutely that's yeah. something i always advocate for in these in these interviews um i did mention this briefly in, in the previous interview but but for anybody that's just tuning in today to to listen to to this conversation it's uh, on reddit it's r slash x inglesia necristo and i'll mm -hmm. put it in the episode description if anybody wants a link to that subreddit it's really helpful it's really handy there's people from all over the world that post in there every day um mm -hmm. about their experiences or looking for advice and it's a really wholesome and helpful community yeah. i posted in there looking for for anybody that might want to come and share their story and I was really uh, blown away by the positive um, reaction that I had to my presence in that subreddit because some people might um, initially think that I am like some kind of savage journalist mm. who's <laughs> looking who's looking to kind of tear people's reputations apart mm. um, and sometimes people might think that my intentions aren't aren't pure in terms of mm. just sitting in having a conversation about people's mm. experiences and stories uh, but that's not the experience I had uh, during the subreddit I was welcomed um, mm. and uh, and people were you know asking if there was anything they could do to contribute um in terms of adding to the blog post which one member has done um and uh, and people just um you know willing to to come and chat so so that's fantastic um but I, i'm just wondering if there's anything sophia that you think we've missed today that would be important to 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 go over before we finish our conversation today no i think that like, the only thing that i wanted to mention is just like it you know, despite everything I've said, it has actually had a positive influence on me, um, not in the way that they would hope, but it's influenced me in terms that I fiercely believe in critical thought. Um, I did test group think like crazy. I can't stand being dictated. Like, this is what you should think and like everything else is wrong. Um, um, it's be and it's because of INC that I do think critically. Um, and because uh, that, that, that's what I try to 
that's what I'm trying to instill into my kids although they're a little bit too young to to get it but um yeah I mean I I do always try and see like positives um from this sort of thing and that that's just like one positive that I actually have gotten out of it if I had to really really uh, dig so no nothing that you missed but just something that I wanted to yeah and I think I think that's something that's been brought up previously in, in other episodes that that it's always important to mention that um especially with the internet as a resource if you have access to it um Mm. wherever you are that there are so many free online critical thinking courses that can Mm. really help with kind of recognizing or or learning how to question without feeling guilty about it or without feeling like why why am why should I critically think um yeah. and everybody should always do that and if you're not doing that then that's probably the first red flag because there'll be yeah, a reason yeah. why you aren't doing that I think everybody's yeah. born with the natural ability to be curious to sense when things could be off uh, if there's a reason why you don't question things if there's a reason why you don't use critical thinking um then then perhaps that that's the perfect reason to look into mm. what critical thinking is and how we yeah. can apply it to our everyday lives. So I think um I think that's a good point that you've just made there. Um and on that note, Sophia, I think it's 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 just important now for me to say thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. It's not often I get to hear another British accent on the other side of the <laughs> computer screen. So that's um that's been a, an, an experience for me today. And I just appreciate you coming here and having this conversation for probably the first time um, out loud extensively. Um, I know that for some people it's it's often quite triggering or can leave somebody in a state of reflection for two or three days afterwards, which, mm. which can make people feel sort of uneasy or um, kind of guilty. Um, but I- Oh yeah, yeah, I, I relate think, to that. <laughs> I think it's uh, so important that these stories are put out there just for anybody else that could be listening who can take even you know even 30 seconds of what you've said today and apply it to themselves and and really significantly improve their situation and their will yeah. well-being just through knowing that there are people such as yourself that will come here and bravely speak about these things on the record so thank you so much for your time today Sophia I really really no appreciate problem. it and uh, thank you for the invitation and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. We'll catch up soon. Yes, it will. Thank you Thanks. so much. Bye, Sophia. Thanks. Take care. Bye. That is the end of this week's episode. To get in touch, please email me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I am your speaker, Casey, and this has been the Cult Vault. <laughs>